So as my kind introducer mentioned, I'm a staff platform engineer at Sotheby's. Um, I'm on a platform team. Um, I've been there for about a year, so kind of just now really understanding the, what's going on there. Um, before that, I was a partner at a consultancy that developed digital projects for arts orgs primarily, and art museums and media orgs. Um, and in those contexts, I was often uh, sort of an on an on-call team of one. So I learned a lot of hard but fun lessons through that work. My relatable hobby is um, pigeon rehabilitation. Um, if you want to talk about that, please find me after. I'll be here all night because uh, I live here. Um, the, the, in the picture here, there's a, a sad looking pigeon. Oops. So I've got a tiny URL link or a tiny.cc link here, slow dash. Some people call them SLOs, slows. Um, overall, I'm just going to be talking about the journey Sotheby's took towards implementing SLOs and my overall opinion on why manage SLOs should be defined as code because it helps scale that process of implementing SLOs within your org easier. So I'm gonna give a Sotheby's specific example of why we need SLOs and then sort of generalize it to engineering orgs in, uh, in general. For, for Sotheby's, you can, it's sort of like, like this, sort of like a, a, a live event. Um, and you know, the, there's a lot of uh, um, lighting and video tech. There's people like up, sometimes up to thousands of people watching on live streams. That's sort of how I got into it, sort of like live sports for a very nerdy type of New Yorker. Um, and when something goes wrong with software systems, there's, it's, it's a pretty bad experience for all these people involved, including the buyers and sellers who, it's, it can be a pretty uh, stressful uh, experience overall, this sort of auction experience. And there's also this charismatic man with a hammer uh, having, or woman, um, often woman actually, uh, and you don't, really don't want them to be angry. Uh, so I'm, I'm live action role playing in some today. Um, there's also another reason why we need SLOs, besides just trying to reduce the number of bad experiences. And I would say that it's the fast change being a sort of constant. And for Sotheby's in the past couple of years, that's mostly been caused by uh, COVID, like the driver of change, meaning that live auctions or online auctions are rather, they started as sort of like a, a, um, a, a sort of marginal part of the business where we sell like vases around 2018, but then uh, over the course of like 2020 and 2021, they became, all those software systems became uh, like in the critical path of the live auction experience. So that, our position going into like 2021 was we need to make these systems more reliable because there's a lot at stake, at least in the context of our, our business. So to generalize this, systems need to change fast for business and technical reasons, like say if you have an NPM package, uh, if you have NPM packages, they need to change fast. But when you modify or maintain those systems, it, there's a higher chance of bad customer experiences. And SLOs try to solve the problem of how do you make that decisions about that trade-off. So you've got to maximize velocity while minimize bad experiences. And in some ways, uh, the SLO is almost like an algorithmic decision-making process. It's gonna give you sort of data-driven, impartial um, uh, input to whether you should be uh, prioritizing feature work or velocity work. So our leadership identified SLOs as a current best practice for SLOs, um, but as an engineer, I had a lot of questions. Um, and I think these are pretty common questions that people have when they start to, start to face SLOs. And I think every engineer um, sort of needs to build their own understanding of SLOs in their own context. And that's sort of why I'm spending a bunch of time talking about SLOs uh, in the beginning half of this presentation, even though I'm sure a lot of you are already pretty familiar with the concept. And I thought I was familiar with the concept before we got this sort of uh, charge from our leadership. Um, the biggest one was, we have really nice dashboards and alerts, why do we need SLOs? And then there's another instinct that I think engineers might have, which is, uh, 
there's other ways to make systems reliable. I want to go write tests. I know there's bugs out there. I can, if, if you give me a couple of days, I can go fix those bugs. Why do we need to implement all these other processes on top? It felt sort of bureaucratic. Um, well, let's take a quick look at this. This is what, you know, if you go press the, the SLO button dash in Datadog, what you'll get. Um, I'm gonna come back to this. I'll basically go through a quick example of the typical SLO implementation lifecycle. Uh, which isn't, none of the steps are particularly easy. The first is determine what matters to you, your business and colleagues. Because SLOs are also a tool to make developers, especially like on-call developers' lives easier. Um, it's not just about the customers, it's also about reducing internal tensions between different orgs and teams, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty, that's, a, that's a, obviously a conversation. Um, another thing is then instrumenting your services to create what's called a service level indicator, or SLI. Um, and the big thing here is being able to differentiate between good and bad behavior, which is not always easy. Like, for example, at Sotheby's, we had a painting that shredded itself in the process of being auctioned. Um, and it was really unclear if at the moment that happened, uh, if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, to the people involved, you can kind of see by their expressions on their faces. It ended up in the long term being a good thing. I think you know overall, Sotheby's wants to create these sort of like high drama uh, situations, but they don't want the computers causing the drama. Um, then you need to have a conversation with all the stakeholders involved to determine what the service level target should be. Um, and there, there's already a lot of good resources about how like increasing the number of nines in, in reliability require like slows velocity, um, so on and so forth. There's trade-offs here and everybody needs to understand those trade-offs. Finally, and I think this is the most important part that makes like the answer to the question of like what's the difference between a dashboard and an SLO, is when an SLO is breached, the team needs to prioritize stability work until the, the um, SLO is back in the, in the green. Um, and this is sort of a life cycle. I mean, you're constantly, you might want to increase the target or decrease the target or throw away the SLO completely. And so now when we come back here, you can see, and this is a real example I'll be using throughout the um, course of this presentation. You've got a failing SLO in the red caused by an incident that happened, or some bad behavior that happened around Friday, the 23rd of September. And you've also got the query here, which is built of uh, um, like a metric a good, what we really have is a good divided by all. So you have this success over all of the things. That's how Datadog uh, implements SLOs. Um, so, so if you've built up this understanding, this sort of personal under understanding of SLOs, there's still a lot of like, where do we, get, where do we start? Um, and one of the things that was really getting to me is like with these prime time events, even if our services are like, on average, 99.99% reliable or something like that. If they fail during a big prime time auction, like, uh, like one of the auctions where there's $50 million paintings up uh, on the, the uh, auction block, I don't think leadership's gonna like really buy into SLO culture. They just really want that not to happen. Um, so I was thinking about that a lot. And then also thinking about like some, in, in some of the more, there, there's often sort of monolithic parts of the code base where there's a lot of teams working on it. How can you create that sort of agreement um, among uh, when there's a lot of people like to, to prioritize developability, uh, sorry, reliability work or, or future work when there's a lot of teams involved in like a given code base or service? Um, we basically decided to try to narrow all these problems in scope and just focus on our team. Um, and that meant first educating ourselves. A lot of this, the education, the outcomes of education uh, you know, uh, I've already sort of outlined at least my personal under, understanding of SLOs. Um, I actually have not read these books. My colleagues have, um, and I read the online browse, uh, like, like the, the, the browsable version of the book, which I was much easier to read, found much easier to retain information from. If you do actually want a book recommendation, I recommend Cigarettes, a novel by Harry Matthews, the one member, American member of the French Olipo Collective. They wrote like the books without the letter E and stuff. It's very, it's very programmer friendly, I think. Um, another thing that's really useful is the resources created by the SLO DLC. That stands for Development Lifecycle, uh, Development Lifecycle Working Group. They, they have a bunch of documents and worksheets that can help sort of minimize the amount of 
writing up of documents and it can be really helpful in the initiating part of the process. Um, and we use a lot of these resources. Um, we also we also thought a bit about our prior art, and like I mentioned, there was a lot of dashboards. Um, I'm going to talk about this partially because I think it's pretty cool, but it's also relevant um, to just sort of give you an idea of how, what our, our our stack is like. We created this automated uh, a Kubernetes operator that will basically generate a dashboard for every um, gRPC service and give you good versus bad breakdown. Um, uh, it's sort of like a REST endpoint if you're not familiar with uh, gRPC. Basically, you're getting per endpoint um, and then per uh, like caller, good versus bad. And these are really useful in incident response. If you're having to debug a service that you're not really familiar with, um, really good for, because of they're standardized, they're good for exploring. Um, and be, they're standardized because it's automated. When somebody spins up a new service, the Kubernetes operator will look at the gRPC endpoints, then create a dashboard for it. So it's, there's like barely any maintenance for this. And it allows you to like smoke test other people's services, which is a pretty useful thing as a platform thing. If you're say upgrading a, a, a dependency or something like that, that multiple services consume. But the biggest problem here is that dashboards don't map to user experiences. And mapping to user experiences is a pretty important part of implementing SRE culture. What this sort of means is that the leadership in your company or the different stakeholders in your company don't care about the Sotheby's Fubar service. They care about gateway service or something like that. They care about people, for example, being able to place a bid. Um, and it's also only applicable to GRP services. There's a lot of things upstream, downstream, up, like in front of a GRP ser service that can go wrong that could lead to a bad customer experience. Like simplest example, stuff in the, in the browser, in the, in the client. So there was a lot of things that were sort of top of mind based on recent incidents, but we just totally didn't uh, decided to not think about these things in our initial steps of the journey because they're not things that our team owned. One thing that we do own is a GraphQL um, API that a lot of the clients consume. But again, this was the sort of thing where there's a bunch of teams involved. So while we really wanted to implement an SLO and probably will soon, uh, it, we couldn't build that agreement among the team, uh, that, that create that sort of team uh, internal agreement. One thing a platform team totally owns is the ability to rely, build and deploy code, CI, CD. So we started with the CD part of that because we thought it was simplest. In practice, Spinnaker is basically just provides a web UI where a developer can press a button and deploy a given Git, Git SHA. Um, and it's a bunch of third-party Docker containers that run in our build cluster, should be pretty easy to instrument something with latency availability. So that means latency, like error codes. That's what we were imagining, thinking it would be pretty easy. But we quickly ran into the where to measure question that I think is one of the hardest uh, parts about um, implementing an SLO after you sort of decide what matters, what good, what good and bad is. Um, you, can, you have to sort of like visually merge your, these two images together to understand our cluster. We're using Linkerd, which is a mesh a service network, a service mesh um, within our Kubernetes cluster. You've got a load balancer and then, you know, uh, uh, and then some Docker containers, pretty standard setup. One place that is sometimes a good place to really to emit metrics from is within the container. That's sort of like the APM approach. Um, but in this case, when it's a third party Docker container, that doesn't really make sense. We don't want to be like hacking on that third party container. And we wouldn't know when it crashes, which is the most likely bad case scenario here. Um, from the elastic load balancer is a really good option in many cases, but we found that it lacked data on per route latency. Even when you're using application load balancer, you're not having, you don't get this data. Um, so in many cases, this is useful if you want to have like a per service um, SLO, but we really wanted to like focus on particular routes in many cases. Um, Linkerd allows uh, this sort of per route experience because it's a, a service, uh, but we found that the, at least the Linkerd version that we were using, uh, and, and there's a, a lot of, like for example, those dashboards, are, the Kubernetes dashboards I was showing earlier use the Linkerd uh, data, 
but the latency data wasn't really there. And we also wanted this SLO to fail if our networking, if there was networking issues. So what we ended up doing is adding sort of an, a redundant Nginx ingress controller, which reports really good data and adds minimal latency. So you can imagine this is what's here. And also, I mean, a lot of Kubernetes clusters have Nginx ingress controller as standard. It's very well understood. Um, and you can see here at the bottom, the query. You've got your all, or sorry, good, which is not 500. That's the HTTP error code uh, approach. And then overall, which is all the um, requests to that ingress. And we also do this on a per route basis. And then with latency, you have a nice thing with an Nginx ingress controller called latency histograms, which are a very efficient way of reporting latency data. Um, and so this allows you to say, anything that's above this upper bound of 2.5 seconds is too slow. Like that's not available enough for, in like an incident. Um, so that, that all worked out pretty well. So that's the CD part of our pipeline. What about the CI part? Um, as in continuous in, uh, in, in, integration, as in building and uh, testing code. Um, there's a bunch of components in CR. It's a little more complex than the CD part. Uh, you've got GitHub, Jenkins, a whole bunch of other things. You need to pull things from Docker registries. There's probably too many to really even list. Um, so it's not really just like instrumenting one service. Um, another, another complexity here is that it's pretty normal for developers to commit failing tests. And that's like a good, a good thing. Like it's, it's a part of test-driven development. And so we don't really want to use the overall um, like build success rate, even though we also have metrics around that. And they're, they're, they are useful. But for this, we really wanted to have something that wasn't noisy. And another thing is we wanted to be able to swap out components uh, without having to re-implement the SLI. So what we ended up doing is creating uh, basically a cron job that would commit a known good uh, tri like trivial change to like an example service that should always succeed and look at the metric that gets output by that. And this was based on API responses. So GitHub is pretty integral. We don't think we're gonna be swapping that out soon. Um, so it's, this is what's called like a pipeline SLO. You have a known good input and you expect a good output. And sorry, I'll go back. Uh, one other thing that this is synthetic data warding. This is what's known as synthetic data and that you're making, it's not a real user that's having a problem. It's a, it's a bot. Um, and this can be a, a number of SLO experts uh, will sort of caution you against this synthetic data because it's computers having problems, not people. And you really wanna focus on people having problems so that developers aren't being woken up in the middle of the night uh, when a computer is having a problem that may or may not actually escalate to people having problems. But we found this worked pretty well for us um, overall. Uh, the issues with the bot surfaced were pretty similar to the issues that humans were surf experiencing. And the overall met data here showed what we sort of anecdotally knew, which was that our, S our overall CI system uh, needed some work, but the CD system was pretty stable. Um, and we did this first time just sort of pressing buttons in Datadog, and that led to things being more disorganized, probably even much more disorganized than this. I mean, like, like CAD, SLO, V1, stuff like that, naming. Um, and so we just sort of set about to organize stuff. The other issue we faced is it was really hard for us to um, understand the multi-window burn rate alerting. Um, I'm sure you guys all totally understand this graph um, and this statement here, but we had a really hard time uh, understanding this and using it, and then, sorry, to go back a step, the promise of burn rate alerting is that it's gonna be less noisy um, and more precise and less flappy than um, standard alerting that isn't based on an SLO burn rate. Um, I'll come back to this here in a, in a bit. Um, but either way, we, had, we spent a lot of time just trying to like like understand it in an abstract sense, but it was hard to like get an intuition for it. So the, one of the big things that came out of this whole process is realizing how much work implementing an SLI and then an SLO is. Um, and we didn't really feel like the process that we did would, 
or maybe 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 every team could do the work to like do do the same process that we did to understand things, but it would be uh, it would be a really time intensive project. Um, it would spend a lot. It'd be very expensive in terms of developer time. Um, so we looked for ways to scale this process better. Um, in the course of organizing stuff, we decided to implement our SLOs using Terraform, the Terraform, using the sort of Terraform uh, or Datadog Terraform provider. Um, that took like five minutes to set up. It was actually our first time using the Datadog Terraform provider, but uh, it just was a quickly made decision that worked out quite well. Uh, so that basically meant create an SLO directory in the mono repo and then define a resource that looks like this. Uh, basically, it's a service level objective. You apply it, it creates the service level objective in Datadog. And you can already start to see some benefits. You have markdown files that are going to be consistent between like dashboards, and it's going to be com committed along with your code. You have slug templating for uh, team names and service names. But the more important benefit, I think, than just that sort of uh, being able to like template variables is that it becomes a visible part of your standard code review process. And this allows you to start, for, exa for example, using code owners so that when an SLO is changed, everybody's made aware of it, or using uh, like adding standards that can be like checked as like part of like a code review checklist for naming. Like for example, SLOs should like map to a user journey as opposed to like the names should map to like a user journey, uh, stuff like that. Um, the activation energy for new SLOs is also lowered. You don't, people can then just copy these Terraform modules, uh, change some of the local variables, and, and then they already have a nice uh, SLO set up. And we, can, we also have like an internal service bootstrapping template called Copier, uh, which is a third party tool you can actually use. It will then, when you're bootstrapping a new service, it'll also automatically bootstrap a new SLO for you. Um, by the way, again, I know these code examples are probably pretty hard to, to see. If you're interested in this, I'll, again, I'll show the, the, tiny, the tiny URL link, the short URL link at the end. Um, we also ended up building some dashboards to help us understand the, the burn rate and error, uh, like the error budget concepts. Um, and we started standardizing that as we started building more SLOs into a Terraform module that generates these dashboards, which we found quite helpful. Um, and the Terraform module took um, like a standard set of inputs, which we think are like the inputs that uh, are most important when you're building an SLO, and then emits a free dashboard. And, each, and then basically each subdirectory will then invoke this, this standard module. So here you can see the interface. You've got uh, the good query. You have the all query. We've got this description, which is important. That's that markdown file, um, the target, and then your, your alerts. And then this will generate a dashboard that looks like this. Again, we're using this same example from the failing CI CD or the failing build system here. I think the most important thing here is the, the, uh, the documentation here, which shows like how the data is generated, why the um, target was set. In this case, it's pretty low. It's only set at 98 and there's a justification for that. Um, and then on the right, you can see the actual status of the SLO. One cool thing that we found pretty useful and is inspired by the books is this uh, error budget burn down chart, um, which is self-documented for every, everything that uses the, the, the module. And here you can see the error budget concept. Uh, when it's in the green, as in like you're above your SLO, you have some um, wiggle room to make, take some risks. And so for example, what causes the incident on Friday the 23rd is we were changing the size of the the, our build nodes, um, which led to an incident, and then we resolved it. And now we're going to, in order to just not uh, make our, the lives of our, our fellow developers miserable, we're going to keep it, uh, we're going to try to keep things pretty stable until that gets back into the green. Um, so to generate that error budget burn down, I think the two most important things are the moving rollup, which is sort of a, a more recent data dog feature. And this allows you to uh, exactly have that SL, that error budget burn down match the, uh, the SLO value or SLI value, which is pretty nice. And then the cutoff min just basically prevents the um, data or the chart from like uh, 
falling to zero, having missing segments, it connects all the points nicely if there's any missing data. The more complicated thing that I mentioned earlier is the burn rate alerting. Um, the most important thing about burn rates is you've got the short window and the long window, and they can work together to eliminate noisy or flappy alerts. Um, and then I think it's a little bit hard to see with the light, but there's this threshold here, and everything above here is red. So like if, if, if either of the lines go above this red line here, um, that's when the alert's going to be firing. Um, and so you can see here on the 23rd when our incident started, both of these quickly went, went above the line. The, I guess the, the, purple, the purple is the short. That's like, I guess it's more sensitive. The long is a little bit less sensitive. Um, they both go up. And then when we resolve the incident, uh, the short quickly drops down. And so our alert stops firing here. Um, so that means we don't have this alert that keeps firing even after we resolve the incident. And that's really the kind of the promise of burn rate alert, uh, alerting. And again, the code snippet here is actually pretty similar to the burn down chart. Um, you're using a moving roll up. You've got some cludging to convert units into seconds. Uh, maybe something like Kalumi might be better uh, for, for this particular case, which is another uh, infrastructure as code um, tool. Uh, and then you've got this default zero to prevent like missing data on the charts, or, like sort of glitched out charts. Um, I think an important thing is all of these things are in part of the module, so that the developer who's implementing an SLO doesn't need to think about this. Um, and what that allows for is a quick, accurate iteration loop. Instead of trying to like reason out what your burn rate threshold can be, you just look at that chart, assuming you have some historical data, and you can raise or lower the threshold. And we did this. At first, we had like a lot of alerting noise where alerts would happen based on like you know uh, some of the real issues we had. But you'd get alerts when like uh, the Docker registry was just down or slow a bit, and it was too noisy. We just kind of like looked and raised the threshold a bit. And so you can basically just move this red line up a bit so it was above these little spikes. And that fast iteration cycle, just like Terraform apply, Terraform apply is a lot easier than like trying to like go in and change the, the graphs manually or in, in Terraform, or sorry, in the SL, in the Datadog UI. Although I do recommend experimenting with it first in, uh, in, 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 in the Datadog UI. Um, so scaling the org, scaling things org wide. We already had the mandate from heaven. The Google model is like the platform team could kind of like be like the SRE team that specialize in defending SLOs. In that case, it didn't really make sense for us because we try to have team ownership over services, full, like sort of the DevOps, classic DevOps model. Um, so, but we did want to ease the pain of SLO adoption and we decided to do some workshops with two teams starting out, which meant meeting with the teams actually in person, uh, each, basically like our team split up, half the team went with one team, half the team went with the other, uh, and then we'd spend half a day with each team for a week with the goal of having like a finished SLO at the end. And each day we'd do kind of a stand up with both teams so we could share ideas, and have a demo at the end of our fi final finished SLO. Um, and the, the workshops were a success in that both teams were able to implement an SLO. The auction team, which maintains the auction platform, built an SLO that was basically like the place bid example I was talking about earlier, um, which we sort of realized actually helps deal with that prime time concern. When you have something as grant, on the granular level of a specific uh, query that only gets invoked during the prime time event, um, that's a pretty good proxy for uh, like what matters to the, from the perspective of users and, and higher level management in our company. Um, so they just sort of solved that problem. I was starting to think of like ways to like do time windowed SLOs. Not a good idea. Just, just figure out the queries that really matter that in, and correlate with the prime time events. Um, the marketplace basically built a thing that was like they'd had issues with their their whole front end bundle not loading, getting a white screen. So they just were like, we want it to report back that things rendered 99.9% of the time. We were pretty surprised by the implementations, and I think this is a good thing. Um, mostly, I've been talking about uh, like Kubernetes, uh, like, uh, uh, like measuring from within the Kubernetes cluster, but both of these teams ended up writing little bits of code that would basically proxy StatsD metrics to the back end. Um, but the data was actually, like the actual uh, collection was happening, or the event that was being determined 
good or bad was happening in the, in the client. Um, and we didn't use a standard, there's tools like this, like segment that we ended up using um, this sort of this, uh, I guess like ad hoc method that we came up with on the fly because we felt like it'd be less noisy. And there's often this sort of spectrum here. The closer you are to the user, the more noise you have. People's browsers crash. That's not really your fault or anything you have control over if, it's, if you're in the cluster. But when you're close to the user, you're getting something that's very close to a real user experience. Whereas if you're in like say the Kubernetes cluster, then that's gonna be maybe further from the user, so it's less representative of the user experience, but it's gonna be less noisy. Um, other people were experimenting with stuff that's even like on the edge, so like our, our CDN, you can potentially collect data from there that's really close to the user. Um, but either way, it was all really surprising to us. Um, and the teams used the Terraform module to, and that was pretty good, like all this happened on like the last day, basically just doing like Terraform apply, and you got this nice chart, and then they could start building intuitions about burn rate alerting and error budgets. Just some quick ideas on the, the like, if you're gonna do this workshop model, it's important to clarify when product stakeholders are involved, because it's important that they're involved like at the, in, in the beginning when you're determining what matters, what's good and bad. Um, but since SLO development and SLI development really is development work, they don't need to be there the whole week, and you don't wanna waste anybody's time. Um, the, like I mentioned before, it's important that the teams lead their, uh, their own process. That you really just kind of like want to um, uh, be there to answer questions and have them lead discussions um, and just provide sort of a framework. Uh, sometimes we would get like too involved in leading the discussion and, and, and the, the quality of like the workshop would, uh, would suffer as a result. Having two teams involved ended up being like a really lucky coincidence, because uh, a lucky thing that we did, because if one team would get stuck, sometimes the other team would like figure out, sort of have a little breakthrough, and then the other team could copy that and vice versa. And that ended up being really important for the success of the workshops. So the future of SLO at Sotheby's, we need to build more SLOs and iterate on the most important SLOs. Try to like, you know, add more nines, uh, make sure that the, the data isn't is it missing data or that they're actually representative of user experiences, so on and so forth. And we also want basically everybody in the org to talk about things in terms of SLOs. So you don't just have these sort of like cyclical discussions about reliability and velocity. It's like people are using SLOs to make decisions and uh, the, like just uh, allocate resources and so on and so forth. We also want to integrate SLOs into our um, uh, developer portal. You might have heard of like Shopify Backstage. I think uh, um, Datadog is starting to work on like a service catalog, which is a similar idea. But basically, this will give like a gold star to uh, mature services, and one of the factors in maturity is having SLOs around it. Um, we also want to use SLOs in the decision making process, so or the architecture process. I actually learned a new term for this yesterday. Uh, which is called like an upside down SLO, where you have a, a service that um, is taking a dependency on something that would have like a 98 percentile uh, percent target, and then like being like our service is going to have a 99.999 uh, 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 availability. Like that obviously doesn't really make sense. And the people were I, I was watching a talk yesterday how they would like automatically find these uh, upside down SLOs. I thought that was pretty interesting because the Terraform could have perhaps enable that. This is an example of like our service dependency graph. Um, this is a Datadog feature. One other really cool thing about SLOs that I, I talked a little bit earlier about the SLO DLC, which includes like a number of uh, companies like Noble9 that also have tooling for SLOs, um, is they're working on something called Open SLO, which is basically a, a YAML DSL. Um, for Kubernetes, for SLOs, which defines all the things I've been talking about before. And it's supposed to be vendor agnostic. So you could say export and import SLOs, or what I really want to do is like or, or Kubernetes apply, or kubectl apply this somehow. I feel like that could be similar to like our, so like maybe the, the SLOs can be sort of automatically adjusted or something like that. I have no idea, but I think there's a lot of room for imagination here. So, um, my over, we got the, the tiny URL here again. It's not, sorry, not tiny URL, tiny.cc, uh, slow dash. It's a kind of contradiction. Um, uh, my, my personal understanding of SLOs is they're kind of like metaphorically, 
like SLIs and SLOs are respectively like the nerves and limbic system of a, of a, like a software organization, as in SLIs give you these signals um, and then your SLOs tell you how you should react to them. Um, and, and that's really what the limbic system is. When there's something that's threatening or really needs to be dealt with, you, you get this like rush of adrenaline or something like that and you go deal with it. That's be a, a failing SLO. But if you're just, if you're still above the green, you know, I'm calm, everything's fine, I can go take risks. And I think that's it. Thanks to my team, some of who are here. Uh, a lot of these ideas come from other people on the team and help with slides. And also thanks to the organizers of uh, Dash. Awesome, thank you so much, Patrick. We are going to take some Q&A, we have a few minutes, so there's going to be mics in the aisles. There's one over here um, and one on the other side. If you have a question, just come up to the mic and then we'll have Patrick answer that. So let me put the other mic over on this side. As folks sort of come towards the mic, um, I do have a question for you. Also, feel free oh. to find me after if you want to talk about these things in person. I did have a question for you. Um, let me, I wrote it down, so let me pull it up. <laughs> um, could you talk a little bit more about the where to measure question? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing here is realizing that there's no right place to measure. Um, I think you can give input onto this, like a, a platform team could you know, help people understand common pitfalls of, of measuring in the wrong place. But it is definitely on a case-to-case -case basis. There's a lot of metrics that you probably have in your system. Um, I think the load balancer is often a good place to do it. I think an ingress is often a good place to do it, but it really depends on like the particular problem you're trying to solve. Uh, did you like find yourself needing to use like Terragrunt or any sort of like wrapper, uh, like Terraform templating tool? Because uh, I found like I guess like the experience of like working with like staging and production environments a little bit clumsy at times. Or like uh, I guess do you also use like Terraform Cloud or like I don't know. Just generally curious about the implementation of the Terraform stuff. We have like it's, our Terraform setup is pretty like uh, modular, and there's lots of like what they call like a state backends that are in S3. It's pretty set, straightforward. All of our Terraform is manually applied. And I think in this case, like there's no CI, like there's not the CI and CD in our org don't uh, interact with Terraform at all. We manually apply it in different environments. Um, I, I have never really looked into Terragrunt, but it's something I'll definitely look into. Um, but like this would allow you to sort of, you know, apply a, a dev, like have, like, you know, iterate on something fast in dev without, interacting with CI, CD, that like, you know, just running Terraform apply um, over and over again. So I, don't, I didn't really find that the Terraform was really getting in the way very much there. Um, I think overall that's, but you know, you could potentially integrate it with CI, but I think the fast iteration loop is important. Cool. Uh, hi there, my name is uh, Harrison Katz. I'm an SRE at Gemini. Uh, thank you for the talk. And one of the things that I notice is uh, oftentimes I'm trying to balance uh, the iteration between the GUI interface that Datadog provides, as well as uh, the code, the infrastructure that's code with Terraform. How do you all maintain that balance or managing the coordination there of reconciling the changes in the GUI with the changes uh, in your with Terraform? Interesting question. I don't know if we've really hit that pain point yet. There's definitely a couple of, like, a lot of, I think I showed a slide that where we, you know, like flag on certain dashboards that are like auto-generated, not by Terraform in this case, where like, you know, this will automatically be written, overwritten, do not edit. Um, I think that, you know, with dashboards, a lot of time it's pretty easy to just throw things away. Um, I think that some of the issues we, we had was like, you know, ordering of different like components and widgets and stuff like that. If they get dragged around, that can create some nasty, like I think that's been the only real problem, but oftentimes it just means like, like kind of having to throw away the dashboard and then re-implement re it, which can be a little bad because then IDs get messed up. But I think that we'll probably experience that pain more in the future. But our, right now, this is sort of new to us using Terraform to manage stuff 
in Datadog, but I think we're pretty excited to continue on that, that route. Awesome, thank you. Hi, Patrick, uh, thanks for the talk. Thanks. I wanted to know, you mentioned in the beginning that you tried to set up SLOs for some GraphQL application, or just in general, uh, we're trying to set up SLO for page response time, so see it from the user perspective, but you have a chain of upstream services you depend on. How do you mm -hmm. go out about that if it's a lot of teams and a lot of dependencies? I think overall, just emitting StatsD um, data from a container, if you're trying to get that. Like, I guess this interesting thing about GraphQL, right, is that basically everything is a 200 response unless you're having like an like a overall failure of the whole system. So we were, like, I think there was a Scala system. The auction team actually first looked, for example, at uh, like emitting, um, you know, StatsD metrics on like a failed place bid. Um, and overall felt like it was kind of both noisy to do that, or, or not noisy, like we would miss data, like it was better to do that in the front end. So like basically like capture the call being made to the back end API um, uh, and see if that fails or succeeds uh, uh, in the client. Um, rather than you know having to litter litter your pretty critical backend code with lots of uh um uh like stats d requests or metric basically emitting metrics everywhere um in your um backend code so we that was the particular decision we made there is basically just make like you know uh make the have a instrument the front end to when when that graphql query is made to the back end look like have a timeout window stuff like that Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question related to uh, burn rate alerting. Sure. Um, did you experience any organizational hesitancy um, related to alerting only on SLO burn rates as opposed to an SLI crossing a threshold with the idea that you're letting bad things through, kind of people dismissing air budget concepts, um, things like that? And, and if so, how did you manage it? Interesting question. Um, I need to think about this for a second. I think that the state of our um, existing notifications was noisy enough that that wasn't a concern. Um, so you know, like I don't know, I've like posted an alerts prod and been like, is anybody like? Is it, there's already a lot of alert noise. Um, so the the goal was more to reduce alert noise. Um, and that's been, that's been pretty successful, at least within the context of the teams that have started using it. Um, and I, I think that you know we also get feedback from like the like the operations teams and stuff. So when people are having bad experiences, we also like those now. Now it's just kind of like another stream of input. But I think that confusing burn rate alerting and error budget alerting is probably like an important concept to make clear. Um, like an SLO failing versus burn rating. But I think that, you know, we, I think our goal at this point is still more to get or, uh, the organization to care about SLOs as opposed to having to distinguish. But right now, mostly, I think the overall thing is our burn rate alerts go into like the team's channel and the team deals with those things. There's not like, they're not being like dumped to uh, uh, like, a, like a, something that is a channel that a lot of people are looking at. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Alejandro Poblete from Goldman Sachs. Uh, are you the only one who uh, creates SLOs for your organization? Because in our case, uh, we have multiple teams that uh, require SLOs. And uh, when we present them the Terraform module, we found sh the users sometimes get shocked between the easy to do an SLO on the UI and the implementation of uh, the uh, Terraform part code where the uh, variables are not easy to understand and they don't that easily reflect what is in the UI. So we have been asking for many of the parts of Terraform to uh, be just to export the JSON object and ship it directly to, to uh, our Terraform code. Have Interesting. You something like that? So, so just to make sure I understand what you're saying, instead of applying Terraform, you would just, Take the JSON that would be generated from the Terraform and directly like make an API call to to mm -hmm. so that 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 JSON object become a call to the Terraform code as just a JSON object. Oh, okay, I see. So you have J the JSON as the input, 
and then that that is used that Terraform in, uh, includes that. That's an interesting thing. Um, I think all of our teams are because of the DevOps sort of model. All of our teams like. Again, this is they're, they're, we're still evaluating the success of this, but all of our teams have someone on on there who is managing, like say, like the database instances that their team uses. So there's supposed to be at least one person on each team that's proficient with Terraform. But we're, no, we're not the only team implementing SLOs. Um, but we do, I guess, maintain this this module that generates the dashboards. Cool. This will be our last question. Hello, I'm Matt. Um, I'm wondering how do you coordinate, you talked a little bit about the upside down SLOs. Could you talk a little bit more about that and how you coordinate those upside down SLOs or SLOs between dependent services? Uh, you gave a great example where a, a downstream service might have a higher higher SLO than an upstream service, which is sort of uh, illogical or, or unnecessary, uh, unnecessary limiting for that downstream services team. How do you coordinate that uh, across the teams and services? Well, I don't particularly know how to do this, but I mean, one thing is like, a, a RFC, like we do have an RFC and ADR process, like requests for comments and then architecture decision record. So I think these things could be surfaced in the RFC process. So somebody is like, this is our idea for our service and then they'll typically talk about the dependencies um, and also, you know, third party dependencies uh, or, or, or not necessarily like, like, you know, external APIs and stuff like that. So I think that's one place where it could come up. Um, the example I saw yesterday, I'm trying to remember what org it was, uh, maybe Indeed. They showed um, being able to automatically detect it in the service graph. Graph. I'm not sure exactly what tooling they were doing, but uh, if I think that's where, what this, you know, when you, where you have either the Terraform or something like OpenSLO, it'd be pretty easy to write a tool that would det automatically detect those upside down SLOs, which I guess is what the, this company did. We also use Bazel, so you could also use something like that to detect dependencies. Um, I think. That's that's a sort of space where having SLOs as code um, makes. I mean, maybe maybe Datadog could uh, detect uh, these things. I think also, by the way, all these dashboards. While I think they're cool, it'd be way better if they were just implemented as part of Datadog. So, hint hint, if there's any Datadog people here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hints received. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Let's give another thank you to Patrick.